Welcome to River of Life. We are so glad you came. If this is your first time here, we would love it if you would fill out a welcome card. It can be found on your chair or at the Welcome Center. And at the end of the gathering, we have a coffee shop, and we would love to give you a free coffee. It's just our way of saying thanks and hope you felt welcome. Teenagers, you are dismissed at this time. You saw the sign for One Accord. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what that is, uh, One Accord is a time where we gather with other churches. Um, a bunch of the youth or music pastors have come together in the past and have put on an, just a night of worship, and it's open to everybody. And so I want to challenge you. It's here this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. It's going to be a great time of just some worship and prayer. And uh, if you are at all available to make it, make sure that you put that on your calendar and come out. What a great way to start the new year. How many of you ate too much this last week? <clears throat> the rest of you are lying. Uh, how many of you plan to eat too much the rest of this week? Come on. It, it's all pre-resolution calories. They don't count, right? Isn't that the way it works? You can eat whatever you want during this time, and then you got to make up for it on the other side. <laughs> That's how I've been living. I don't know. Uh, well, we're starting a new series tonight that I've entitled uh, Redefine Me. And um, the reason that we're doing this at this particular time is many of us, as we step into the new year, are going to spend some time having new resolutions. Uh, how many of you have already made a list of New Year's resolutions? Anybody? Nobody in the room, we're all just right, just the way we are. Nobody needs to change it. That's why I love this church, because we're all got it all together, right? Uh, <coughs> well, if you're like most Americans, you've made some sort of a resolution. Maybe you just don't want to admit to it. That makes it a lot easier to break after the first, if you didn't admit you had it in the first place. Uh, but as we look at who we are supposed to be, I hope that uh, our, our hearts cry and and our desire would be to be who God wants us to be and to allow him to be the one that defines us. So we're going to start this series tonight and we're going to look in the in Luke chapter 14 and we're going to start with verse 16. And it says this, Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests at the time of the banquet. He sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. That one kind of speaks for itself. Uh, <clears throat> the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house is full. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word tonight, I pray, Father, that you will speak to our hearts that, God, we will, uh, on the brink of this new year, as we step from 2013 or 2012 to 2013, and, God, many of us probably have ideals for what this year will bring. I pray, God, that we will look to your word 
and to be true followers of who you want us to be, God, that, Father, we will allow you to speak to us and that you will be the defining force in all of our lives. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at redefining ourselves, as we look to allowing God to define us, the first step to this is doing away with excuses. I believe that as a, as a culture, as a people, we've come to a place where we allow ourselves to have a lot of excuses. We have excuses for why we do the things we do. We have excuses for why we don't do the things that we should do. We've got excuse after excuse after excuse. It's interesting to me as I reread this story again. It's a story I'm familiar with. If you've grown up in the church, you've heard this story before. But one of the things that I find very interesting about this story is the fact that they're being invited to something good, and yet they're still making excuses not to come. It's one thing if the, the owner of the house had said, hey, I'm having a work day, and I want you to all come and clean my toilets. And they all, oh, hey, I, I got to go look at my field. I got to go check on my oxen. I got to do all these things. I, that's a little bit more understandable. But he's wanting to have a big party. He's wanting to have this big banquet, and he wants all the people to come. And as soon as the invite goes out, all of a sudden, the people begin to make excuses. Probably I, I need to relate this a little bit more to modern day living because I don't know that any of you have ever missed church because you had to go check on your oxen. Anybody ever miss church for checking on your oxen? A few people up in the skybox are raising their hand. <clears throat> but let's look at these excuses. There were three excuses that were given throughout this story, and I think that they all can apply to our lives today. The first excuse was this guy who had to go and look at his field. Um, now, I'm going to relate that to the, the excuse of people that are out seeking money instead of their relationship with Christ. I think this is a big one. I think we live in a society right now where it's very important. We want to have all that we can have. We want to we want to be able to have the, the nice house and we want to be able to have all the accessories that we should have. We want to be able to put gifts under the tree that are going to make our our kids proud to be our kids. We want all these things we want because that's what society tells us that we need in order to fulfill what uh, what's missing maybe in our lives. The second person uh, I'm going to equate to being too busy, too many responsibilities. And the third, well, he has a wife, so I guess that's his excuse. So let's look at this for a minute. There's riches, responsibilities, and relationship that keep us from his table. Verse 18 said this, but they all alike began to make excuses. And I was thinking about this. Uh, you know, we live in a world that obviously there's evil in this world. We can't look at the events of the last few weeks without understanding that we live in a world where there is evil. For somebody to go into a school and to shoot it up, there is an existence of evil. But a lot of times we think that if we're not doing evil, then we're okay. And I want us to relook at that a little bit as we are about to step into this new year. And maybe you are in a position where uh, you're about to make a uh, resolution. Maybe your resolution is to be more organized. So you'll put off making that resolution uh, until right before the new year. I don't know. Um, but the enemy will feed you all kinds of excuses to keep you away from the table of God. You know, he will put all kinds of things in your life that will keep you busy. And they can be good things. But he'll keep you busy and distracted to keep you away from the table of God. Now, we look at this, and we read this story, and the, the homeowner wanted to have this big banquet, so he invited all these people, and not one of them said, hey, I'm not coming because I hate him, did they? Nobody said that. Nobody said, hey, you know what? That guy doesn't throw a good party, so I'm not going. No, they began to make excuses. I'm busy. I've got this going on. I've got to go tend to my field. I've got this relationship that I'm dealing with. And so they began to make all of these excuses and a lot of times, I think for us as believers, we put ourselves into a position where we allow the enemy to feed us excuses not to do what God wants you to do in your life. First of all, let's, let's break down these excuses for a moment. The first guy says that he's going to look at a field that he bought. Who looks at the field after they bought the field? That doesn't really make a lot of sense. I don't think that was a good excuse. The other guy was going to look at oxen that he already bought. How many of you have ever went and bought a car and then test drove it? Anybody ever do that? Seems a little backwards to me, right? 
So I'm kind of thinking that these guys are just making things up. This other guy has a wife, and we'll just let that one go. The problem isn't the pursuit. These things were not bad things that they were doing, but the problem is the priorities. A good thing can become a bad thing when we try to make it a God thing. For many of you in your life, you've got so many responsibilities. You've got so many things that you're doing. And so when you get called upon to, to minister, to reach out, to help somebody, you would love to. Oh, I would love to be a part of that. Man, I love to hear Jason get up and brag about the food bank and the clothing closet and all that they're doing. And man, someday I just hope that I have time so that I can participate in that. But if you knew my schedule, if you understood how busy I am, did I mention I've got a couple of kids and we got things going on? And so, so maybe someday. And you know what? Having kids, that's a good thing most of the time. And, and, and you, that's good. But a lot of times we begin to make that become an excuse that stops us from doing what God has called you to do. So as we step into this new year, my challenge to you is to begin to recognize good things and God things. Because God has called each and every one of us. It doesn't matter if you accepted Christ just this last weekend. God's got a call on your life. It doesn't matter if you've been in the church your whole life and you've never participated in anything. God's got a call on your life. Maybe you're here for the very first time and, and you're just kind of checking out this whole church thing. And, and you're not sure what to expect. Can I tell you, God has a call on your life. But there's a lot of good things you can get sidetracked with that often will take precedent over the God things. When I sit down with my leadership, there's a lot, a lot of times that we will sit down and we will talk about, man, we feel like maybe this is an opportunity for us to step into a situation and we begin to chat and talk about it. And one of the things that we say all the time is this, is this a good thing or is this a God thing? Because we can get sidetracked doing all kinds of good things, but as a church, we want to focus on the God things. God has a call for us. He has a plan for us. And we can go out and start all kinds of ministries. You know, we could start five ministries a week if we wanted to. We could, we could, come, we could walk down the street and see all kinds of needs and try and meet every one of them. But how many of you know if they're not God-ordained, they're not going to work? And we're not going to accomplish what God's calling us to. And it will probably distract us from the God things. Exodus ch uh, chapter 20, verse 3. No other gods, only me. I want you to hear that again tonight because it's something that we know. If you were raised in the church, you know that there are to be no other gods before him. Some of you are looking at me tonight and you're saying, hey, I'm not doing anything bad. I'm really trying to keep on the straight and narrow. Maybe you're missing out on some of the opportunities that are before you and, and you'd say, you know, Jason, it's, I'm missing out. Maybe I miss church uh, regularly, but, you know, it's, it's not because I've started a satanic cult in my basement and we're slaughtering cows randomly, okay? Why? Because nobody's going to be tempted with that. Spence, I'm not going to be able to tempt you with moving from, from your faith to, to starting a cult. And you, by the way, good to have you guys here. You, is this your last Saturday before you head back home? I'm totally ADD. Sorry. He's like, thanks for talking to me in the middle of your sermon, dude. That's awesome. <laughs> it is. All right. Well, you and Cody, thank you guys for coming back home and playing for us. They're involved in an internship out in Seattle, and it's always great when they're home and they're able to play and sorry i'm easily distracted um <laughs> but see 99.9 .9 of us wouldn't be tempted to do all these bad things what the enemy does is he'll take good things and he tempts you to make a god thing out of them so he will take something that is a good thing in your life something that seems like hey this is an opportunity this is a possibility for me and all of a sudden now you're focused on this thing and it was never god ordained in your life he never set it up for you, but you just begin to follow it. And I've watched so many people with this call in, on their life to the ministry. I had a really good friend who was called to the mission field, and I know he was supposed to go to the min mission field. And all of a sudden, he got this good job, and he started to work this good job, and, and, and he began to, to see, hey, there's fruit in this. And so he began to work it out, and then he, he kind of convinced himself that, Hey, maybe what I my calling was wasn't to go on the mission field, but maybe I'm supposed to supply money for the mission field. 
And so he began to do that. And I've watched him just kind of flounder around his whole life because he took what was a good thing, a good job for while he was in college, and he made it into, in his mind, he turned it into a God thing. And it never was. God called him to the mission field. And so he missed out on his opportunity. Some of you have your kids in so many leagues and activities. You are running around like crazy every hour of every day so that when the weekend comes, it's God's day, and the enemy says, you know, why don't you just take a day off? You guys are so busy. you got so much going on. I mean, you're running from the time school gets out till the time the kids go to bed. You're running and running. Wouldn't it be nice just to take a day off? How many of you ever felt like that? I'm going to be honest with you. I felt like that. We've done that. We've, we've taken time off, not while I was pastoring, because they notice when you're gone. But, uh, but when we were in between, there were those times where we were just so busy working, and Sunday would come around, and, and you just go, man, it's been a busy week, hasn't it? Yeah, wouldn't it be nice just to have a family day? Yeah, let's have a family day. And so you stay home, and the family day usually involved this. Wow, this is quality time, isn't it? But you miss out on a God thing because of a good thing. It's a good thing to have a family day. But so often the enemy can convince you to miss out on something. And I am convinced with all my heart that on those days when I missed church, there was something for me there. And the enemy did everything he could to stop me from going because he knew I needed to hear something and I missed out. As a youth pastor, I would sit across the desk from parents with their 16-year-old daughter who was sneaking around with her boyfriend or their 18-year-old son who was getting in trouble with the law. And they would ask me, how did this happen? And many times I would watch as they were the ones that didn't encourage their children to come to church. They were the ones that said, hey, I think they're old enough to choose. I think they're smart enough to make their own decisions. I don't want to force church on them because if you force church on them, then they won't want to go when they get older. Let me just say that as a youth pastor. Not true. Your children learn by your example. If church is a priority to you, it will become a priority to them. If you treat church like it's a a hobby, something you can do or can't do, then it will become a hobby to your children. Somebody's trying to copy my nice little hand motion. That's glad you learned something from tonight's (laughs) message. Asking a youth pastor... What's wrong with my kid when they turn 18 or 19 years old is like going to a mechanic with your brand new car that only has 20,000 miles on it and saying, hey, something's not working right and I don't understand what the problem is. And the mechanic says, well, how often have you been changing the oil? I haven't changed the oil. Why would I change the oil? It's a brand new car. Everything seemed to be running just fine. What would make me think I needed to take it into the mechanic shop? Everything is working just the way it should be working until it's not. It's the same deal. As you look at your family, parents in this room, I want to challenge you. You need to understand that it may seem like everything's going good, but you are instilling in your children values and what's important. And it is time for us to step up and quit trying to be our our kids' friends and start being their parents again. See, that was extra. That wasn't even in the notes, but you see, the king comes first. We need to see through all the the smokescreen of excuses. Another excuse, and it's um, it's amazing because Derek didn't tell me what he was going to share before he shared it, uh, but I have in my notes here is that we don't deserve to sit at his table. And I think there are so many Christians that run around and they act as if they don't deserve it, so they can't have it. They can't sit at the king's table. They can't can't have what's rightfully theirs. He can't cover my mistakes. How is it that I am worthy to be in his presence after having the abortion that I had or the divorce that I went through or the lies that I've told or the past that I have? There's no way. But I want to tell you this evening that the table is already set for you. We often use these excuses to avoid discomfort and pain. 
Isn't it funny how excuses come up when you are going to do something that, you, you know, whenever you're going to go exercise, how all of a sudden, man, my, my knee's a little, it's, it's tweaking a little bit. I'm not sure what's going on there. I, maybe I better take a day off because uh, I don't want to, I don't want to make that thing any worse than it is right now. But you know, if all of a sudden my wife came in and was like, hey, we're going to, we're going to meet some friends. We're going to go play laser tag at the hub. I'd be like, yeah, let's go. You don't make excuses for the fun stuff. You only make excuses for the stuff where maybe there's a little pain involved or it's a little bit of discomfort. People who make excuses not to come to church, I believe a lot of times it's out of a fear that they will be confronted or maybe they'll have to change some stuff in their life and that will become painful. I thought about this as a little illustration. If I was to stand up here, and we're going to be doing this soon, where we're asking for people to step up and come to a work night here at the church. We've got these new units that we need to uh, do a little work in, and we just need some people to come and help. We'll give you some information about that. But if I was to stand up here right now and say, hey, in uh, this next week we need people to come every night of the week for our work night. And it's going to be like five hour days. It's going to be grueling. Right after you get done with work, you're going to come out here and we're going to make you work hard and you're going to sweat and it's going to be tough. And we're going to probably yell at you a lot. And it's going to just be like that. That's the way we are here at River of Life. We like to yell at you and make you uncomfortable. Okay. How many of you know, I would not get very many people to sign up for that job. We would have a sign up back there. We could have Derek standing at the door with a clipboard and, and really trying to pressure you into doing it. And we'd be lucky if we maybe got three or four people to sign up for that job, right? However, if I was to say, you know what? We were blessed as a church this year. And, and uh, some people uh, just thought, man, we really want to bless whatever members of River of Life uh, want the blessing. And so we just bought, we bought, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of gift cards to uh, Southgate Mall. And so whoever shows up on Tuesday night, you're all going to get a gift card to the mall, and we're going to all go shopping together, and you get to buy whatever you want. How many of you know we would have a good turnout for that night? Then we trick you and give you a hammer and say, go get to work. No, just kidding. I want you to hear that for a moment because when, when people hear about this Christ thing and this commitment to following him, oftentimes we treat it like it's a work night, like it's something that we should be afraid of and we've got to make up excuses. Again, look at this story. They're being invited to a party and yet they're making excuses not to come. When the reality is, this is the most amazing journey you will ever be on in your life. It is the most incredible thing that the king of the universe wants to have relationship with you. But yet we make excuses all the time. When people consider selling out for Christ, they get scared of all the things they're going to miss out on in life. In an, in an effort to avoid missing out on what we think matters, we miss out on the only thing that really does matter. Let me say that again because that was a pretty good point. In an effort to avoid missing out on what we think matters, we miss out on the, the only thing that really does matter. You see, if you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, if you believe that, it, that God sent his son to earth to die on a cross so that you and I can have relationship and that we can have eternal life through him, then this is the most amazing journey there is. And there is nothing on this earth that can compare to that relationship with God. But so often we fight because we want to have both. We want to hold on to what the world says is important, but yet we, we still want to have our foot in the church so that we can experience some of what God has for us. And I want to tell you that balancing act never works. You either need to say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, or you need to just walk away from this thing because it's a miserable existence to try and live in the middle. These men were preoccupied. And they saw things completely out of whack. Excuse number one, when we put our trust in stuff rather than him. Derek talked about this tonight, but it really does come down to trusting him. When you deal with finances, it's one of the hardest things. It's one of the hardest areas for us as people to let go of. But that's why it's one of the most important things for us to learn to let go of. Because either you 
trust him or you don't? Are we more concerned with our field than we are with his feast? There's nothing wrong with having stuff, but there's something wrong with your stuff having you. Jason, you don't understand. This is my busy season. Excuse number two, too busy. Once I get this promotion after my raise, but right now, Jason, I need to focus. If I don't focus, I'm going to miss out on this. Can I tell you on Monday night, we had one of the most amazing Christmas Eve services. I know many of you were out of town. Some of you were in town but had prior obligations. But I couldn't help as I left here of thinking, though, uh, thinking about those who missed out as we were able to take the money that we, were, that we raised over the last few weeks for this family that was in, in a desperate situation and we were able to, right there in front of everybody, bless them with Christmas presents and then bless them with a check and to watch from my perspective. Sometimes I wish some of you could see what I see. Sometimes it's people sleeping, but a lot of times, like that night, it was people crying. As I watched, as people were just amazed and were able to be a part of this amazing moment together as a church family. But we often miss out on things because of our excuses. The third excuse that was given really comes down to relationship. As I thought about this, I thought about the fact that obviously there's nothing wrong with relationships. Relationships are good. They're important for us. But oftentimes we put relationships in front of the most important relationship. I had the opportunity uh, this year to go and uh, spend some time with family in Las Vegas. And uh, as we went to Las Vegas with uh, actually Shannon's family that's in the room, we, my brother-in-law said, hey, we need to hit one of these big buffets. And so, you know, I argued with him for a while and no, I didn't. We went to a buffet. And buffets are not cheap like they used to be in Vegas. They're expensive. So you go in there and you better have a plan if you want to get your money out of the buffet. Okay? But I kind of made a mistake. I walked in and the salad bar looked really good. And so I thought, I'm going to have some salad before I eat something else. So I began to pile on the salad. And then I went and they had all these breads. Now, I'm kind of a bread guy. I'm Captain Carbs, all right? So I like the carbs. So I went and I found the breads and the cheeses. All right, you got me right there. So I went back to the table and I've got my salad and my breads and my cheeses. And I begin to eat. My brother-in-law David comes around the corner with his prime rib, his lobster, his crab. No, it wasn't lobster, it was crab. Lots of crab. Pile of crab. And he's like, dude, you are wasting it on that. This is where it's at, right here. And as I thought about that, it A, made me hungry. But then B, it made me think about the fact that there are so many times in life that we walk in and all these relationships are so important to us and right around the corner is the best relationship of all. Right around the corner from where we are, if we would not waste so much time on these little piddly things, we get to the crab and the prime rib. God wants relationship with you and so many of us are so distracted and our excuse is, but you don't understand, I've got this relationship. I've got this boyfriend that I'm, that I'm working on and I'm hoping that he's going to accept Christ or I, I've got this, I'm trying to mend this relationship with my parents or I'm trying to do this or my kid, whatever it is. And those are all good, but they're not God. And if you put someone else in front of your relationship with God, then you have made them God in your life, and they do not deserve that position. For some of you, you've put a bitterness towards a relationship in your life ahead of your relationship with God. That anger that you've had for so long, and you feel so justified in it, that you have now put that in a position where that is more important to you than this. And now you're in trouble. Because it's become an excuse and it's become something that's stopping you from having a right relationship with Jesus Christ there is no human relationship worth compromising your relationship with your heavenly father for 
As Christians, we need to stop with the excuses. It would, it would make sense if you were invited to a place where there was torture and wrath. But this is a table of grace and mercy. The king is a giver, and he wants good for you. In America, we've lost a sense of urgency. See, I think for many of us that sit in this room tonight, you go, you know, Jason, I agree with what you're saying. I've been that excuse maker. I've been the one that's made excuse after excuse. And I will make it right at some point. But that urgency isn't in us anymore. Why? Because we can come in any week. We can go to, we can go to 50 different churches in Missoula. And we can hear a message that's good. And we can be challenged a little bit. And someday I will do something with this message that you're talking about. But not today. Can I tell you, there is an urgency to this message. The banquet is coming. God wants you sitting at the table. Too many Christians underneath the table eating the scraps. And God is saying, why are you doing that? I've got a place for you right here. And all it takes is for you to say yes. All it takes is for you to show up and allow God to do what he wants to do in your life. So tonight as we close this time together, I'm first of all going to ask everybody in the room to close your eyes with me. If you're here tonight and you'd say, Jason, I'm sitting here and I don't know that I even have a right relationship with God. I hear you talk about this and you make it sound so easy. And can I tell you, this first step is so easy. God made it that way because he loves you. He's inviting you. The invitation is out and it's got your name on it. And all it takes is for you to say yes. So if you're in this room today and you just say, Jason, before I leave this room today, I want to make sure that my relationship with God is right. I'm going to ask that no one else is looking around in here. I'm not going to have you stand to your feet. I'm not going to even have you walk forward because I just want to pray with you tonight before you leave this room. If you're here tonight and that's you and you just say, Jason, before I leave, I want to make sure that my relationship with God is right. Maybe you've been a follower of Christ in the past, but you've walked away from it. Tonight is your night. Maybe as I talked about that relationship and you've got bitterness in your heart and you need to get rid of that. Tonight is your night to be set free from that. So wherever you find yourself, if you're ready to renew this relationship and start this journey with Jesus Christ, would you do me a favor while no one else is looking around, would you just lift up your hand and catch my eye because I want to pray with you before we leave tonight. Is there anybody like that at all in the room? Okay. Okay. Anyone else in the room tonight? Just say, Jason, before, you, before I leave, would you just pray with me? I want to make sure that my relationship is right with God. I'm going to take one more moment. Is there anybody else? This isn't a moment to be ashamed of. This is a moment of awakening. This is a moment of joy. It's a moment of understanding that there's a God in heaven who loves you and has good things for you. Anyone else in the room? Just say, Jason, before you close this time. Okay. Anyone else? Tonight, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and maybe you didn't have the courage to raise your hand, but you know you need it to. Whether you raised your hand or you didn't, if you will pray this prayer and you'll mean it, you're starting this journey with Jesus Christ. Your sins will be forgiven. You are accepting the invitation to his table, and there's no better place to be. I'm going to ask everybody in the room if you'll repeat this prayer after me goes like this. Dear Jesus, I thank you for your grace and I praise you for your mercy. Forgive me of my sin and help me to follow you from this day forward. God, I want you to redefine me. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close this time together, the worship team is going to sing one last song. But my challenge to you tonight is this. Wherever you're at in this journey with Jesus Christ, maybe you hear some of yourself in some of these excuses. 
As we step into a new year, this is a perfect time not to make a resolution that you won't keep, but to have a redefining moment in your life. To say, God, I am no longer going to allow relationships to define me. I'm no longer going to allow the bitterness that I have towards this other person define me. I'm no longer going to allow my job to define me. I'm not, no longer going to allow my stuff to define me. But God, you are going to be the one that defines me. And as you do that tonight, if you're sincere, I believe with all my heart that for some of you, you're going to feel a weight lifted from you. Because there's something about allowing the creator of the universe to do what he's wanted to do in you for a long time that is freeing. So tonight, my prayer is that in these next few moments, this room is going to be an operating room for God. That he's going to be able to work in your life, to do what he needs to do, to make you who he needs you to be. So as we close this time together, would you stand as they sing this last song, but take some time right where you are and just allow God to do what he needs to do.
each of us to put you at the very center, to put you at the very first in our lives, Lord God. God, that we wouldn't make up excuses, Lord God, that we wouldn't look to other things, Lord God, but we would continually look to you, Lord God, knowing that you would supply everything that we need, God, knowing that you are the very best and you are the most important thing we can ever put our focus on. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for each person that's come here tonight. God, move in us. Continue to move in us as we leave this place. God, stir in our hearts, stir in our spirits, Lord God, that we would would be more like you, that we would be closer to you, God. God, I pray that as we leave this place, that you would protect each person. God, that you would be on our hearts, God, that you would consume our minds, Lord God, that we would continually think on you. We love you so much. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. All right, everybody. Uh, The only announcement I have is uh, we have the One Accord worship night on Wednesday night. And we'd love to see as many of you there as possible. Uh, Other than that, have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week.